unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we begin each Lent with Jesus in the wilderness doing battle with the devil. And that is followed by Jesus rescuing the Canaanites, or the Canaanite woman, her daughter, who was demonically possessed, if you recall. Today we find Jesus casting out yet another demon. But this time he pulls back the curtain just a little bit more than usual, showing us what we cannot see with our own eyes. And so let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, in our gospel lesson, a pestilent spirit has taken up residence within a man, making him both unable to speak and, according to St. Matthew, blind. The demon holds this man prisoner in darkness and in silence. He is shut in upon himself with no one to free him from this dreadful condition. But Jesus can. No demon can stand up to Jesus, just as no Philistine could stand up to Samson of old. But Samson, from what we recall, Samson never had to deal with demons. This bodily possession will end as soon as Jesus says so, for he can cast out a demon with a word. When he did, most people marveled. I mean, this can't be the son of David, can it? This isn't the promised Messiah, is it? Absolutely not, the Pharisees say. And then they come upon this. They say, we know his trick. We know how he's doing it. And what they conclude is, is that Jesus used unholy power to accomplish his purposes. They said, he does all of this by the power of Beelzebul, meaning Lord of the Flies. It's a mocking title for the devil. So don't be so gullible, folks. Just go back home. There's nothing more to see here. Jesus takes orders from Satan, and that explains everything. Jesus, though, tells them that this conclusion that they have reached absolutely makes no sense. He's not in collusion with the devil, explaining that their argument is both illogical and inconsistent. This is who they're actually dealing with, Jesus says. He says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now catch that phrase, the finger of God. This is a reference to when God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. We just heard it read. Do you remember when Moses threw down his staff and it became a snake? Pharaoh's magicians did the exact same thing, but they did it by means of dark arts, by means of sorcery. They used what the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of. And what you know, their staffs turned into snakes. But recall this, they were gobbled up by Moses' staff. Pharaoh didn't seem to be impressed by that. But then came the first two plagues of water turning to blood and then of calling up frogs to infest the land. Pharaoh's magicians... They were then summoned once again, and they were able to replicate these two plagues. Because, as I say, demonic forces were at work. But then when that third plague struck, the one with the gnats, the reason I do that for gnats is because actually it's lice. Lice. I mean, if gnats weren't bad enough, but lice... Everybody, man, woman, and child, and animal had lice. And even though the magicians then tried, they could not replicate this. They came to the end of the road. They're out of their incantations. They're out of their spells. All their, you know, eye of newt, right? All these little formulas that they had a little while ago, they don't work anymore. 
And Pharaoh's magicians knew that Moses is being helped by one who is stronger than the demons. And they tell Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So follow the logic. If pagan Egyptian magicians could recognize the finger of God, could recognize that one stronger than, than demons is at work, Jesus is asking the Pharisees point blank, why can't you do the same? He is equating them these religious and devout and pious Pharisees as thinking like Gentile sorcerers. All because of their unbelief. The crowds are not wrong. They have got it spot on. Jesus is the Son of David. Jesus is the Spirit-anointed Messiah, ushering in the kingdom of God. And to prove it, what's he do? He delivers the demoniac. This ain't no collusion with the devil. This is actually an invasion of the devil's territory. Beloved, when it comes to the devil and his horde, our mistake, and really this is our sin, is to think, every, think in terms where everything is based upon what we can see and what we can measure. So since we can't see demons, nor can we see the devil, we think, eh, doesn't really exist. But Jesus, as I said at the outset, what he does is he pulls back the curtain showing us spiritual realities as to what is really going on and he does it with a parable. And this parable is like one of my favorites. It goes like this. The strong man is the devil. The one who brought sin and death into the world upon all people. The strong man's palace is his kingdom which comprised the unbelieving world. Remember the kingdoms that the devil tried to tempt Jesus with? If he would just bow down and worship him, do you remember that? That's the strong man's domain. And what are the strong man's spoils? What are his goods? It is the souls of mankind who by sin and unbelief belong to him. The strong man guards them. Night and day with no way of escape. You know, this always reminds me when I come to this section in the lectionary. We, we'll see this. Uh, every year, it seems like, uh, you know, we'll get a report of this. And it's of some man who somehow or another kidnaps some young woman and puts her in his basement and keeps her there for years. And then somehow or another, through an act of God's mercy and providence, she's able to escape and people, when we hear this story, we, 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 just, we, we just can't even fathom the depravity and the perverseness of this. How dare this guy do this? That's exactly what the strong man does to all the souls of the world. Those are his spoils, and he guards them night and day. You see, right after God cursed Adam and Eve, he placed a curse upon the strong man which happens to be a precious promise of grace and victory. God promised a stronger man, as he's speaking to the strong man, he promised a stronger man who would come, who was born of a woman, who would defeat the strong man by crushing his head. Now the strong man, he's going to get a good lick in on, in on the strong man, or the stronger man, bruising the devil's, or excuse me, bruising Jesus' heel, but most assuredly, he will lose. And so here comes the stronger man, and this stronger man is your Jesus. And he's not afraid. He's not afraid of the least bit. Jesus enters into the strong man's palace. He binds the strong man, and he rescues all those held captive, doing so right under the strong man's nose. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees, and he's telling us, I am the stronger man. I'm the one who was promised from Genesis 3.15. I am bringing the kingdom of God to you. But how exactly does this happen? How does this stronger man, this Jesus, how does he do this? 
Well, it's not in a way in which you would think. You'd think the stronger man would crucify the strong man, but he doesn't. The stronger man allows the strong man to overtake him, to slander him, to blaspheme him, to torture him, and crucify him. I mean, look! That's what he allows the strong man to do to him. He's the stronger man? Are you kidding? He's on a cross. And that's how he defeats the strong man. It appeared to be a loss. It appeared to be a defeat. But the stronger man conquered by his death. Just listen how the writer to Hebrews puts it and see if it all comes together for you. He says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that's the stronger man, that's your Jesus, he himself likewise partook of the same things, flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, the strong man, and deliver all those through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. All right, so how then, what was won at the cross, how is that then delivered to you? Does it come to you by way of UPS or FedEx? Does a drone deliver to you what Jesus did there? No. Beloved, it's the exact same divine finger which is the work of the Holy Spirit. He was at work when the pastor spoke the words over you at your baptism. Depart, thou unclean spirit, make way for the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a baptism here in a couple of weeks once it gets solidified. Listen to the rite of baptism. For the first thing that is said over the baby by the pastor is, Depart, unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit. The unclean spirit that imprisoned you was cast out in holy baptism. St. Paul says it like this, He, the stronger man, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Sure, to the unbelieving eye, baptism looks more, nothing more than just some ancient churchly ritual. Yet, with the eyes of faith, it is the stronger man binding the strong man, ransacking his palace and bringing you safely into the ark of his church. I mean, this is what... This is why our structures look like this. It's to, look, it's to resemble a boat. You're sitting in what? The nave. What word do you hear in nave? Navy. Water. You're the baptized. And you've been brought out of the devil's domain into the ark of God's church. Why? Because one mightier than Samson has come. And that is your Jesus who as we sing every Reformation Day, he is the valiant one who holds the field for how long? Forever and ever. But it doesn't end there. Do you think the devil is content with being plundered? That he's just going to let his treasure that he guards night and day just sashay out the door? That he's fine with that? No. It's why Jesus adds this twofold warning. Yes, the devil is defeated, but he's still dangerous. Take it or leave it, but I liken him to Hannibal Lecter or some mob boss somewhere who still somehow pulls the strings, still manipulates things from the inside of a prison cell. And thus, because of that, we must be on our guard. So Jesus says this, whoever is not with me, this is the one who does not take his faith seriously, is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying there's no middle ground. There are only two parties, either of light or of darkness, either of God or of Satan himself, and it is no joke. And then comes the second warning, where he describes more of what we cannot see, but he can. Now this is, this is wild. 
What does a demon do when it's been cast out by the finger of God? Jesus says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places. Huh, waterless places. Kind of far from the baptismal font. Why? Because demons can't stand baptism. It's where they've been overthrown. And off they go, Jesus says, seeking rest. Demons seem to be discontent unless they have a house, unless they have a, a person to abide in. Jesus says, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. The house is empty because at some point, the person cast aside the Lord's word, rejected the mercy and the kindness of Jesus, gave themselves over to sin to live however they wanted to live. Have you ever, in a cold snap around here, walked around your house and tried to plug drafts? We used to have a drafty house in Kansas. There's a lot of, a lot of holes to plug. I mean, I would put a pillowcase here, a towel there, my sock over there. Folks, we, we've got more to be concerned with than some cold air getting into our house. For when we harden our hearts towards the things that insulate us from the threat of demons, Jesus says it comes up, it takes a peek in the window, and it sees that the house is empty. And then Jesus says, then it goes and it brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Well, I'll say. There's no Holy Spirit there to stop them. How haunting is this? Folks, you can call this poppycock if you'd like, but I'm not going to risk it. You'd be a fool to, I think. I don't want some unholy spirit to be squatting in my house, and I sure don't want his nasty buddy that's there either. So what do we do? Well, the answer is found in what happens next. There's an unnamed woman who cries out this blessing. She's seen what Jesus has done. She recognizes him to be who he says he is. And so she, she says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. True. So true. But Mary is not going to help us with the spiritual battle that we're in. We need to know what keeps us safe from demons. What keeps our house occupied with the Holy Spirit, leaving us with nothing to fear? Jesus says, he tells us right here, here's the key. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those who treasure the word of God, who hold fast to it. What do we teach the kids in catechesis? Who do not despise preaching and his word, grab hold of it. Gladly hear it and learn it. They hold it sacred. That's what Jesus says. And this is what keeps your house occupied. This is what keeps the devil at bay. Shielded by faith and guarded by the sword of the Spirit. So again, the strong man is overthrown in baptism. He is beaten back by the preaching of the Word. He's dethroned when the speaking of the absolution takes place. And he's cast out when we receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in his supper. Beloved, this stronger man is your Savior who saves you from everything that can harm you, from sin, from death, from even the devil himself. So, might our stronger man keep us all in the one true faith. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.